editor of ABC's Ramp Up, the online space for news, discussion and opinion about disability in Australia. Born in Stall in Western Australia, a really beautiful part of Victoria, Stella cut her activist teeth at the age of 14 by conducting an access audit of shops on the local main street. I did that in Denoa, couldn't I? Yeah, I did. <laughs> it doesn't take long. It was a pretty short street. <laughs> Since then, she's been active in the disability community in a variety of roles, including membership of Victorian Disability Advocacy Council, the Advisory Council, Ministry of Advisory Council and the Department of Victorian Communities and with Women with Disabilities Victoria. Stella was a two-time finalist in the Melbourne International Comedy Festival's Raw Comedy Competition and has hosted eight seasons of Australia's first disability culture program, No Limits, aired on Channel 31 and community stations across the country. So you can see that, we've, that, that Stella is a fantastic journalist, which I don't know that it says, it says that, but, but um, your career in journalism is really Stella. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, had to do that. Help yourself. <laughs> okay, welcome Stella. <laughs> I've managed to clip this onto myself, but I don't know whether it's on. Is it, can you hear me? No. No, excellent, good. Um, oh, how's that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether it's that one or the one that's clipped me, but um, we're mic'd up anyway. Excellent. Um, it's such an honour to be speaking here today. I actually attended my first Women with Disabilities Victoria event uh, when I was 17. Uh, it, back then it was the Victorian Women with Disabilities Network and there was a barbecue held on International Day. And I arrived at this barbecue with a friend of mine at the Peacock Inn in Northcash. And I'm not proud to admit this, but I pretty much lost my shit. <laughs> I grew up in Stall, which was a really small town. And I didn't know any other disabled people. And you know what? I didn't really like other disabled people. <laughs> at all. It's very uncomfortable. But I did have this one older friend who was also a wheelchair user. And she took my little teenage self under her wing a bit and started taking me, started having me down to stay with her in Melbourne for the weekends. And she used to take me to all sorts of stuff, you know, she snuck me into <laughs> pubs, she taught me how to catch the train, she took me to Sexpo once, <laughs> very adventurous. And she took me to this barbecue, where I met a lot of you who are here today. And I just want to say that this barbecue, it absolutely changed my life. I arrived feeling like I wanted to crawl out of my own skin. It's quite a miracle that I didn't just sneak out that side gate of the beer garden at the Peacock Inn, I reckon. Uh, as a teenager, I used to spend a lot of time fantasising about being able-bodied. I'd always been surrounded by able-bodied people and I thought that that image was the one that I should aspire to. I'd never seen people who looked different and moved differently and communicated differently. I'd seen people in hospital but never in real life. Arriving at that pub and suddenly finding myself surrounded by you lot was probably the most confronting experience of my life to that point. And I couldn't be more grateful for it. I, it was with many of you in this room that I found community over the next few years. I started reading books about the social model and developing some identity politics. And I'd really like to particularly mention Leslie Hall, who I met at that barbecue on that day. As I'm sure all of us in this room know, Leslie was a formidable advocate and a very uncompromising woman in all of the best ways. You know, meeting her as a 17 year old absolutely scared the living daylights out of me <laughs> and I really needed it. She clocked in me what I now recognise as internalised ableism straight away and she had absolutely no time for me and my crack. I'm incredibly grateful for the way Leslie has equally challenged and supported me in my life and in my career. I've learned a lot of the things I know about myself from other women with disabilities. I learned from my friend Caroline Bowditch, who dragged me along to that barbecue, how to really land in my own skin and love it, and that I can wear red lipstick during the day. <laughs> I learned from Harriet McBride Johnson to live a rich and messy life and never apologise for it. I learned from Laura Hershey that the journey towards pride is a hard one and it takes practice. 
So now, almost 15 years beyond the beer garden at the Peacock Inn, I've not only come out of the veritable disability closet, I can't seem to shut up about disability and what it means in our lives as individuals and as a community. Particularly issues surrounding gender and disability and the double disadvantage faced by women. I should say at this point that I proudly identify as a woman with a disability, a disabled woman and a crip woman, so forgive me if I use those terms interchangeably. But I'm not actually supposed to be waffling on about my identity politics. I've been asked to talk about what the NDIS can do for women with disabilities. And to do that, it's useful to look at some of the ways women with disabilities experience double disadvantage in Australia. The Women with Disabilities Australia report Gender and Disability, an overview of the status of women with disabilities in Australia, did a fantastic job of summarising the issues faced by women and girls. So I'm going to quote a few things from that report now. <coughs> We know that there are about 2 million women with disabilities living in Australia, so we make up about 20% of the population of women. More women than men are classified as disabled, particularly as ageing populations mean larger proportions of elderly people are women with disabilities. Women with disabilities face multiple forms of discrimination and are often more disadvantaged than men with disabilities in similar circumstances. <coughs> what is going on there, my goodness? Is it a bit too close? God, boobs are always so close to my face. How's that? Is that better? Oh, wow, sorry about that. Um, we face particular disadvantage in the areas of education, work and employment, family and reproductive rights, health, violence and abuse. Oh, okay, right. Thanks, Maria. Okay. Thanks. My, my dad's a sound technician, I really should know better than this. <laughs> um, women with disabilities experience violence, particularly family violence in, and violence in institutions, more often than disabled men. Gender-based violence, including domestic and family violence, sexual violence is, is a cause of disability in women. Women and girls with disabilities are often at greater risk of violence, injury, abuse, neglect, mistreatment and exploitation than disabled men, both within and outside the home. We're more vulnerable as victims of crimes from both strangers and people who are known to us, yet crimes against women with disabilities are often not reported to authorities. Almost half of people with disabilities in Australia live near or below the poverty line, and women with disabilities are more likely to be poorer than men with disabilities. We're less likely to be participating in the paid workforce than disabled men, and the unemployment rate for women with disabilities hasn't changed significantly in the past decade. The unemployment rates for disabled men have actually decreased, which is good news for them, but still. Employment of women with disabilities in the Australian public service is at a rate of 2.8% compared to 3.9% of men with disabilities. We're more likely to be sole parents living on our own or with our own parents than disabled men are because we're often, we often have less financial resources than disabled men, we're particularly vulnerable to living in insecure or inadequate housing. Women who acquire their impairments while they are married and are, are at a higher risk of divorce than disabled men and often have difficulty maintaining custody of their children. Women with disabilities who wish to become parents often face significant barriers in accessing healthcare and other services both for themselves and their children. Women and girls with disabilities are drastically more likely to undergo coerced or involuntary sterilisation than boys and men with disabilities. And I've actually spoken about this quite a lot and you've probably all heard this story a million times, but I had a narrow escape from being involuntarily sterilised when I was four. Um, and I'm very grateful to my parents for protecting me from that. We experience more extreme social categorisation than disabled men. We're either seen as hypersexual and uncontrollable or desexualized and entirely inert. Media images contribute to the presumptions that women with disabilities are unattractive, asexual and outside what society tells us is beautiful. We're more likely than disabled men to be exposed to practices which qualify as torture or inhumane and degrading treatment, like sterilization, forced abortion, violence, forced medication and chemical restraint. 
It's very clear that issues of exclusion have a huge effect on women with disabilities in particular. Last year, I was asked to respond to Alan Jones' statement that women are destroying the joint. <laughs> to most people, that statement was pretty laughable. But to me, as a disabled woman, it was particularly so. I thought, destroy the joint? Shit, I'd be happy to get in the joint. <laughs> The multiple forms of discrimination faced by women and girls with disabilities are very real in our lives. Thankfully, what's also starting to become real in our lives is the prospect of a better support system for all people with disabilities in Australia. For too long, we've lived with an unfair system that has fed a culture of haves and have-nots. The divide between those who've acquired their disability in a car as opposed to at birth the constant fighting and paperwork and begging for the merest scraps of support. It's worn us out. I'm tired. We're all tired. But I've also never been more energised because we're on the verge of great change. And change is actually here. There are already people receiving support under the NDIS in Victoria. There are people whose lives actually changed on the 1st of July this year and it's a wonderful thing. Jenny Macklin is here today and um, she's going to speak after me. But I'd just like to thank you personally, Jenny, for just getting it when so many people just don't. So, round of applause for Jenny. <laughs> the NDIS isn't about welfare, it's about rights. And it's about recognising that a one size fits all approach to disability support doesn't work. Certainly the needs and concerns of all people with disabilities are very different and this is very clear when we look specifically at the concerns of women with disabilities. This is why the NDIS must have a focus on gender. You simply can't provide individualised support without recognising the issues unique to disabled women. In hindsight, I don't think we've been talking enough about gender when we develop any disability policy. Disability is seen as a minority group and men and women and girls and boys are frequently just lumped together. The NDIS is a policy which we've all been very unclear about for a long time. Questions of who's eligible and who's not, what it will fund and what it won't, have preoccupied us for a really long time. You know, I still don't know the answer to the question of whether my next wheelchair will be funded. Who knows? I am thankful though that I'm in a relative position of privilege. I'm educated and employed, and while I don't particularly want to spend my income on keeping myself mobile and functional in society, I can. And that's a position that not everyone enjoys. You know where I have heard gender mentioned a lot in discussions about the NDIS? As recently as last week at the National Press Club, someone asked Minister for Social Services, Mitch Fifield, whether the NDIS funding can be used to pay for sex workers. And it always makes me laugh when people refer to discussions of sexuality and disability, and particularly sex workers, as a taboo topic. It's not taboo at all. It's all anybody bloody wants to talk about. It's getting boring. <laughs> and the sex worker conversation is all, almost always about men. There are, of course, exceptions, but overwhelmingly that conversation is about men. Disability is seen as an emasculating experience, and we all know that the worst thing that you can do to a man is make them less manly. Yes, there's sarcasm there. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we very rarely talk about, oh, my notes are gone. Um, then, <laughs> where did they go? Oh, but yeah, we very rarely talk about the sex lives of disabled women. And the persistent framing of sex and disability conversations around access to funded, support, to funded sex workers is actually pretty damaging in itself. People with disabilities, men and women, must have the same access to services as non-disabled people, should they choose to use them. But we must also have conversations about good body image, good self-esteem, healthy relationships, how to love and respect our bodies and those of other people. So what can the NDIS do for women with disabilities? It can acknowledge the double disadvantage we face. It can recognise the fact that women with disabilities are also carers. It can ensure that women with disabilities can access supports to become parents. It can recognise the need to tailor services and supports to women and girls. 
if the new improved refocused services we can access under the NDIS don't factor in a gender framework, then we can't hope to have them meet our individual needs as they're designed to do. It's very hard to get these issues that affect women on the agenda, so we must keep talking about it. I said before that we're tired because we've been fighting for such a long time. And we have. And I deliberately haven't told you any terrible stories of women I know today living in poverty and without support, or women experiencing family violence, or women struggling against a system that would rather remove their children from them than support them. We all know these stories. For many of us, they're our stories. The NDIS represents the greatest chance we've ever had to address the disadvantage faced by women with disabilities. We have to make sure those, those issues get on the agenda and stay there. Women with Disabilities Victoria is doing such wonderful work and we should all spread the word far and wide. The potential can't be underestimated. What I want the NDIS to do for women with disabilities is to take me back to that day at that barbecue where I was uncomfortable and excited and learning, where I felt part of something great, where we could talk about pride and rights and respect, not how many showers a week people are having. I want the NDIS to give us more opportunities to celebrate this wonderful community, the Crip Sisterhood as I like to call it. And I'm looking forward to a day when I can sit in a sunny beer garden with all of you and learn and celebrate and share our stories and be proud. It's International Day again on Tuesday, and with each one that passes, we're closer. <laughs>